Well, welcome to Higher Ground with the Washington Times. Excited to chat with you. A lot to hit on here. I want to start with some of the trends that we're seeing culturally. A lot of, unfortunately, a lot of negative trends, right? When it comes to statistics about the church, young people falling away and, you know, this percentage of people are Christian now and it's down 10 percentage points from a few years ago. What do you think is driving some of those numbers that we're seeing? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, I, I honestly think, and, and I think there's data that backs this up, um, is we've got a significant discipleship issue in the church. Uh, as I've paid attention um, to some of the stories and some of the articles and some of the books being written about kind of deconstruction and the walking away uh, of uh, really a whole generation, it seems, uh, a million a, a day or something crazy like that. Um, one of the things that strikes me in most of those, not all, but most of those stories is that they're describing a disappointment or um, a frustration um, that the Bible's been pretty explicitly clear will exist even for the believer. So oftentimes I, I find myself wondering what gospel um, these young men and women said yes to. And so if, <laughs> if the goal of the church is decisions over discipleship, then, then I think this is what you get. You get a, um, a, a kind of acidic moment of history, like the one that we're in, where the very air burns the nostrils. And, and then you have the influx of all sorts of information. And le- like, you know, 20 years ago, a, a pastor might screw up in Louisiana. And if you lived in California, you'd never hear it. <laughs> but but now it's just like every time you open your app, there it is again, and there's an example of why this shouldn't be trusted, or why these guys are just in it for money and power, or and and so I, I think we have a significant and profound discipleship issue in the church where we have not done a good job of explaining the realities of being human beings, even in Christ. And that means there'll be disappointment, there'll be frustration, there'll be suffering, there'll be disillusionment. And and all of that is in the Bible. Like we shouldn't be surprised by it, but because we're, we so want to kind of just get the decision, I get anxious sometimes that we kind of soft sell uh, the reality of after that decision. So then what ends up happening is, is Jesus, if we're not careful, becomes this kind of errand boy where we ring this bell and we're fully expecting he's going to give us that thing we ask for. And and Jesus isn't anyone's errand boy. And and I, I mean, gosh, I've been pastoring a church for 21 years and I still, we are still running across um, men and women who've even been in our congregation who, when things get difficult or when they get what I would just call the phone call uh, or when some guy or gal they've been listening to or watching online stumbles and falls, that there's this like, what what just happened? And, and you want to be empathetic towards that and move towards that. But, but I want to be really fast to point out in the scriptures how frequently um, things go bad. The, the people are disappointed. They're confused. They're disoriented. And yet have clung to Christ through uh, the last two millennia uh, as the one who won't let them down. Now, the, where this can turn is if you think Jesus owes you some things that he he certainly doesn't owe you. And, and that's when I think the real disillusionment begins, when it, it wasn't that this pastor that failed you or this guy at the church that failed you, but but you feel like it was Jesus that failed you. Mm, yeah, I mean, there's so there's so much there, right? And, and I know a lot of people, they talk about church hurt, and a lot of that is, is very real. There's also, though, you mentioned the influx of information. I think we have to be really careful what we're allowing in. And a lot of us are allowing a lot of stuff in that maybe even 10 years ago we wouldn't have, and yeah. we're not allowing in enough of the good stuff that we need to be, you know, whether that's yeah. obviously reading scripture, you know, just being in prayer, doing the things that we're supposed to do. I mean, you take your Netflix time and you compare it to your spiritual time, and for a lot of people, it becomes pretty <laughs> convicting, you know, when you see that. So it becomes not too shocking when you see this young generation ra- being raised up with all this information and having some of these perspectives. But but let me ask you this, what, what encourages you? Because we talked about the negative, but you know, you've been at the helm of a church for a long time now. What do you see that gives you hope? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what, I am extremely excited that Gen Z is starting to make their mark on the church. Um, you know, it's funny, you, like, like I think millennials, what are they, 40? They're in their 40s this year. 
Um, yeah. And so Gen Z, I, I'm, I know a, a specific, a, you know, good sized group of them. I, I kind of work with um, this organization called Think. I just did the Next Gen Summit for them. And, and I was in a room with just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of Gen Z leaders, not, not all of them in the church world, like a designer at Nike, uh, a pretty famous DJ. A, and man, they are beginning to leave their mark on the church. And there's a, there's a renewed call to holiness. There's a renewed call to deep discipleship and one another in one another. And, and I, I just, left. I mean, I literally left Nashville. That's where this was on the plane home. And, and I couldn't be more excited about the next decade for the church uh, because man, I'm a Gen Xer. Uh, I am so like, there is so much about the next generation that I, I don't understand. And when I try to understand <laughs> it, it doesn't look authentic on me. Uh, you're just not going to find me wearing skinny jeans anytime soon or like it's not, if I tried, I would be like um, Phil from Modern Family. I, I'm just not, I'm going to just be authentically me. But man, this group of leaders in Gen Z right now, they are bringing energy, vitality, beauty into the church. And I, I, like I said, I couldn't be more excited about how they're going to leave their mark uh, on the church of the future. Yeah, you know, it, it does feel like you look at all these negative numbers, right? We look at the biblical worldview numbers and all that, and they need to be contended with. They are negative. But Absolutely. then you see these, these young people, though, like what you're saying, who are so devout, who are so in it, who really get it. And you have to have another conversation, too, about some of these stats, right? Because do I really believe that 60 to 70 percent of Americans are truly Christians in the Christian, the biblical sense? No. Sure. No, I don't. You know, I think people are saying they're Christian. Um, so, you know, the numbers can be a little deceiving, but to see this this crop of young people, and, and I've seen it too, it's so encouraging. It's so in incredible. What would you say to people, though, who might be listening or watching right now, and they kind of feel like they're maybe stuck in the middle, right? They're, they're a little yeah. lukewarm right now. They want to have a better spiritual life, but they're not sure how to get there. What would your advice be? Yeah, man, that's a that's a great question. It's honestly a question that um, being in Dallas, Texas, uh, I I try to answer a, a lot uh, because there is a there is a large group of men and women, really, and I think you can pull way back, not just Gen Z, but millennials and X's and even some boomers who have a real spiritual hunger right now, but but feel somewhat stuck in the moment that we're in. And, and I think the answers that that are the real true answers are, are the answers that have always been the the answer. And, and that is um, that the presence of power of God is readily available to anyone who would seek it out. It might look different than, than we think it should, and it might not have the feelings that, that we might want to come with it. But some of the things that I've seen very helpful uh, in the lives of people who feel stuck a bit um, is, is the, the consumer mindset, which is the mindset we all live in. I mean, I mean we can't, you've got to be super aware that that's the lens by which you're seeing the world, that this can help me and this could, I mean, even this conversation is kind of wrapped up in that. I don't think that's bad. I just think we have to be aware that that's how we're oriented around the world. Like the question is, how can I, me, get out of this malaise that I find myself in and move towards a deeper intimate relationship with Christ? And so uh, I would say a couple of things that I've seen to be really helpful in the church. In fact, I, I, I just left uh, a, a meeting this weekend between services that was like this. Uh, and, and this brother was looping back around from an earlier conversation we had. And I had encouraged him um, rather than um, just trying to do the ecclesiological buffet thing where you're going to four different churches to get all the little things you like, what would it be like to just pick one? It doesn't have to be the village. It can be whichever you, you feel the Lord's leading you to. And what if you went in and began to serve others, find a place of serving others rather than, you know, kind of taking the position of um, that does this church have all the things that presses all my buttons? And he was circling it back around with me yesterday, briefly between services, that, that man, his relationship with Christ and the intimacy he has with the Father has just completely opened up as he's begun to give himself and pour himself out to others. And so I think that's a big one. Uh, another one, and I, I'm just going to preach this um, for the rest of my life, now, I, I think we have to learn to be patient with the process. Um, like the process of sanctification is lifelong. I, I'm, I, I would call it the long journey home. And it is 
full of ups and downs and mountaintops and valleys. And some of those mountaintops uh, are extended. Most of them aren't. And a lot of those valleys are extended, but most of them aren't. And so I think there has to be an awareness that the Lord is accomplishing something in this season, even if I'm not enjoying this season, and to move towards the Lord in the season of I feel stuck here. I don't want to be stuck. I, I want to grow and I want to uh, I, I want to know you and serve you and live a spirit empowered life. And and so I found those two things to be the most consistent um, kind of rattlers of the malaise that you're describing. If you will take to the Lord, I this season I'm in is disorienting me. I, I feel far from you and I don't want to feel far from you. Uh, I, I don't feel like I'm walking in that fullness of life that you promise. Please reveal to me if there's something in me that, that's, that, that's serving as a hurdle to that and, and then begin to pour yourself out for the good of others. And I think those two things, in my experience as a pastor, have moved people out of a malaise. I lo- I know I love that. And I think it goes to what you were talking about before too. You know, people say the prayer and that's not the end of it. Making sure they're prepared to understand what a Christian life and a Christian walk looks like, the ups, the downs, all of it. It's not going to be easy, right? And when you properly prepare them for that, I think it's easier to come back to those things even when when people may become lukewarm or fall away, those two things that you just mentioned. Now, you, you have been, again, at the helm of a church for a long time. Now, you've seen a lot of things. One thing that I have found interesting, and this is not a new issue. Obviously, we see it happening in Scripture. But some of these debates that we get in within Christian churches about all sorts of issues, and some of them are very serious issues. Others, they're not salvation issues. I mean, I think about the, the fight about deliverance, the fight about the rapture. The, I mean, there's sure. a million things that we could reference how do Christians navigate these things appropriately? Because I feel like we oftentimes teach them, we treat them all like they're salvation issues to know yeah. and have discernment to properly engage. Yeah, so I think I think the way I would answer this question is that you've got the big C church. Um, you've got the church uh, all over the world, right? Uh, every continent, almost every language, almost you've got that big C church that we belong to. And, and that that belonging is one of orthodoxy, the close hand salvific issues. Think uh, uh, Nicene Creed, Apostles Creed. And, and then you have what, what's been called secondary issues or second tier issues. And, and I think this is where the, these play out really at a local church, that, that a local church can have a, a different ecclesiology. They can have a, a different eschatology. They can organize certain ways. They can value different things. That they, they can say, hey, these are secondary issues, but they're super important to us. So here at this church, these are our secondary issues that we land on these things. And then they can you know broaden the door or shrink the door. They could say to be a member, you have to align with these things, or you, you can join here, but you need to join knowing that these four things are important to us. And then, man, then grace, 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 grace to people who land in different places. If everything's the gospel, nothing's the gospel. And so I think it's important to understand the difference between orthodoxy and these secondary issues. And then on the secondary issues, I think it's good and right for a local church to have positions on these things. They're almost always matters of discipleship. But then to take those secondary issues and weaponize them against a different church or a different movement or a different network or a different denomination, that these are the things that are, are not only not helpful, uh, but they really tear down, I think, the beauty uh, of what the people of God should be, maybe especially in this moment that's so divisive. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And and I think that's great advice. And people, you know, we need to take that advice because I think the the politics, the chaos outside of the church, the the way people are behaving around that, it's sometimes coming in and infecting how we behave around theology and differences, right? And so you know, it's yeah. almost like we're 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 like rage tweeting at each other inside of churches <laughs> instead of just, you know, dealing with these things appropriately. Now, I could talk to you about a million different topics, and I'm definitely going to have you back on again. But where can people go? I know you've got the Overcomers, you know, your podcast, obviously your sermons. Where's the best pe- place to send people to see everything that you're putting yeah, out? Yeah, I think they could they could see all that we're up to on PastorMattChandler.com so that we've got resources there and books there and um, sermons are and, and the podcast are on all the platforms. But if they're wanting to know more just about 
um, kind of what we're working on, new things, um, that pastormattchandler.com, they can go there. I send out a newsletter uh, once a month and, and even have a little audio clip of what I'm kind of thinking on and working on in the background. It's not really public facing yet. So that would be the place to go. I love it. Well, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Come on, Billy. Appreciate you.